Matthew 7, 7 and 8, the King James text today reads, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Father, we love you, God, so very much, and we are so grateful, Lord, for the opportunity at this time to come into the house of the Lord. We're grateful, God, that we've come up in a nation where we're able to freely uh, worship and we're able to freely congregate and gather and come together that we might lift up your name and give you the glory and the honor that is due your name. Master, in the name of Jesus, I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need the touch of God. It is not within my ability to deliver to your people any word, let alone your word. It is not within my ability, God, to be a blessing, a help, an encouragement to your people outside of and apart from the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Anoint today the speaker, anoint, O oh God, every hearer, not only those in this place, but those who are listening and watching by reason of the internet, both live and later by reason of recording. Speak to our heart, speak to our mind, speak to our spirit. Let the truth of God today liberate and set us free. For the promise of your word is, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We ask it all today, Father, in that blessed name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. People, you know, I, I talk about the prophetic. Uh, people do not understand the prophetic at all. I, if there's anything I have found in the church... People do not understand the prophetic. It is not all about, quote-unquote, predictions, you know, predicting the future or, or, you know, prophesying future events. That is not what prophecy is all about. Prophecy, in its simplest definition, simply means this, speaking, thus saith the Lord. In other words, you are speaking very much on God's behalf. You are saying exactly what God wants you to say. What the difference between a prophet or someone that God uses in prophecy and the average Christian a lot of times is very simple. The difference is this. A prophet or someone that God uses in prophecy is willing to say what God wants them to say even though the hearers are not willing to hear what God wants them to hear. <laughs> Do you get it? Some of the most hated, reviled people on the face of planet Earth, especially in the church, have always been the prophets. If you think Jeremiah was popular in his day, guess again. If you think Ezekiel was popular in his day, guess again. If you think Malachi and Jonah and all these men were, you know, great celebrities? I'm going to tell you something, folks. No, the prophet of God is someone who's willing to speak, thus saith the Lord, whatever God lays on their heart. When the Lord called me to preach as a kid, I, uh, I had a very bad nervous condition at the time when I was young. And I said, Lord, how in the world can you use me? How in the world can you possibly speak through me and use me in ministry when I have all these tics and all these nervous, uh, you know, uh, habits and what have you? And I just could not, for the life of me, Lisa, understand how God would ever be able to use me. Could not see it. And one day I was praying and I said, Lord, you know... Uh, how are, you know, I, I, you can't use me. I mean, I'm just a kid, and, you know, I would get up in church as a young man sometimes to testify, and the Spirit of the Lord would get on me and anoint me, and I'd begin to prophesy and preach. And, I mean, I was 12, 13 years old. 
I didn't even realize what all was happening, <laughs> to be honest with you. At the time, I wasn't, uh, I had an uncle who mentioned something to my mother one time, said, you ever notice when Chuck preaches and when Chuck prophesies? And my mother told me, but I said, when Chuck preaches, or Chuck, when do I ever preach or prophesy? <laughs> because I didn't see it that way. But when I'd get up to testify, the, the Spirit of the Lord would anoint me, and I'd begin to say things, and I'd begin to admonish the church, and I'd begin to admonish the people of God. Things that were not merely originating in my head, but that the Spirit of the Lord was putting in me to say. There were things God was trying to say. God has to speak to the church through the prophetic because... There are many times when he would like to speak to us directly, Martin, and we won't listen. We won't hear. So the Lord says, okay, I'm trying to speak to you spirit to spirit, but you don't want to hear me in the spirit. So I'll put a voice to him, and that way you can hear it with a voice. And a lot of times he'll speak through preaching. The Lord will speak to us through preaching. I, I don't know how many times, I've been preaching a lot of years, about 35 years or better than that even, and I don't know how many times people have come up to me and said, I just asked that very question of the Lord, and today while you were preaching, lo and behold, you answered the exact question that I was asking God about. And it may not have been a question that was in context, uh, Johnny, with my message. But somehow in my preaching, you know how every once in a while I go off on a little tangent, I go off on an off-road, you know, I take an off-ramp. Well, a lot of times those off-ramps are God answering people's queries that they've had. And I'll wind up going, there have been times I've been preaching and I've gone off on an off-ramp and I've said things over here. And afterwards I've said to myself, why in the world did I do that? I'll listen to the message online and I'll say, Lord, why did I go off on a tangent over in this direction? I don't understand why I did that. All of a sudden I get an email. Oh, brother, that whole message blessed me. But when you said, blah, 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 and it's that exact thing that for the life of me, I couldn't understand why I said it. And they'll say, but when you talked about, blah, 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 that was exactly what I needed to hear. That was exactly something that I had been asking God about. I remember growing up as a kid, the pastor of the Pentecostal church I grew up in uh, the, the one that was my pastor when the Lord called me to preach when I was eight years old, Brother Richard Babcock. And Brother Babcock would be up there preaching, you know. And every once in a while he'd say, now somebody out there is asking the question, ba ba da ba 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 And Johnny, I swear to God that I'd be sitting there, and that was the exact thought that just went through my head not even five seconds before. You know how the Bible said... When Jesus was teaching and preaching, it says, And he, knowing their thoughts, said such and such. You see, the Lord works through the prophetic, even while the preacher's preaching. So a lot of times... It, you don't realize that it's prophetic. You don't realize that God is speaking to somebody. He's answering their question. Sister Cynthia from Austin... She came to church one time when we were over here at the Super 8. She came to church one time, and uh, she didn't get to come up very often, you know, because she lives all the way in Austin. She came up one time, and after the service, she was so delirious and so excited. And she came to me, and she said, There were three things that my friend and I were talking about in the car. Do you remember that movie? She said there were three things we were talking about in the car before church today. She said, and by God, if you didn't hit every one of those three things, you answered every one of those three questions tonight in your message. So prophetic is not about, you know, eyes rolling around in your head. It's not about always predicting the future. It's simply... Being willing to say what God wants to say. Because a lot of times what the Lord's trying to tell us, we really instinctively don't want to hear. 
I mean, you know, when I get up here and say, folks, I hate to tell you, but we got a flood coming. You know, we got calamity coming. Well, who wants to hear that? You know, I don't even want to hear it. I got news for you. I don't even want to say it. I really don't. Because I get sick and tired of people looking at me like I'm retarded. You know, I get tired of people looking at me like I'm crazy. I've been living with this my whole life. And it drives me up the wall. It's like, why do people have to wait until all hell breaks loose before they believe you that all hell's about to break loose? You know, why do they have to wait, Martin, until it all happens? And then, and then like I've said, and I'm not kidding, I've had family members do this. And then they turn around and they're like, oh, well, gee, I don't remember you saying anything. You don't remember me. I was saying it for years. I mean, I'm not talking about something I said once or twice. I'm talking about something I said and I said and I said. And they said, well, gee, I don't remember. Oh, how convenient. I want to tell you a little secret today. This message is prophetic. And what I mean by that is this. This is not a feel-good, happy, hallelujah message. This is a message where God is trying to speak to somebody. I don't know exactly who, I don't know exactly why, but he's trying to answer somebody. He's trying to tell somebody something. This is a, thus saith the Lord kind of message, okay? And it's not, don't think for a minute, I'm going to get off into politics and current events, because that's not the nature of this message. But I want you to understand something. I've just been talking about how God speaks to us, right? God speaks to us personally, one-on-one. -on -one. He'll speak to our spirit. There are times when, Johnny, a thought enters your head and you're like, where in the world did that come from? Where did that thought come from? Where did that... But it was God. The Lord planted that thought. He passed that thought through you. And it can be something as simple as you need to go by and see your mother. Or you need to go by and do this. Or you need to do that. It can be something so simple. And yet you go and you wind up being there when a calamity occurs. Or when a, something tragic occurs. And if you hadn't have been there, maybe that person would have died. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? So the Lord was telling you, get, get over there because something was going to happen. He doesn't tell you something's going to happen. He just tells you, get over there. Do, do you follow what I mean? So God can speak to our spirit. He can literally just kind of put a thought through your head. He can speak to you in a way that you're not hearing an audible voice, but you hear an internal voice. And you know it's not you. Usually I know it's not me and it's God when it's saying something I sure enough don't want to hear. That's when I know it's God. Or when I'm being rebuked or chastised. And you shouldn't have done that. Now I know it wasn't me because I felt perfectly justified in doing it. So <laughs> I felt perfectly justified in saying it. But all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord said, like, now you, you know, you shouldn't have done that. And I'm like, all right, Lord, I get it. Okay. Then he'll speak to us sometimes through preaching. He'll speak to us through the prophetic. A lot of times when we're struggling with something, a uh, bill that maybe we feel like God's spoken to us and we're, we're pretty sure we've heard from the Lord, but maybe it's something we're just really struggling with. The Lord told me to go to such and such a country and be a missionary. Ooh, boy. Well, I don't want to just pack my bags and run off to be a missionary. I want to make sure I heard from God. Well, the Lord told me to move to such and such a place. You know, I want to make sure it's God. I don't want to just get up and move. So sometimes what will happen is the Lord will speak to us through the prophetic in order to confirm something. And all of a sudden, somebody will come to us and they'll let us know, Hey, do you know what the Lord told me to tell you? He told me to tell you that he does want you to go be a missionary at such and such a place. Or he told, now that person couldn't have known what was going on in your head, couldn't have known what you and God were talking about for all the money in the world. But God will speak through them to confirm something. I've, I've told this story before. Growing up as a kid, you know, we think the gay issue is the only issue that's ever been a major divisive point in the church. That is not the case. When I was a kid growing up, man, if you were divorced, you might as well have leprosy. You might as well, I'll tell you, you might as well just have big old sores all over your face because 
uh, people looked at you real funny if you were divorced. There had to be something wrong with you. If you were divorced, there had to be something wrong with you. You had to do something wrong. There was always blame to be laid if you were divorced. There was blame to be laid. And in the Pentecostal church, if you were divorced, they wouldn't ask you not to come to church. You know, they wouldn't tell you you weren't welcome. Now, I know in other churches they would. But in the Pentecostal church, we never told people they couldn't come to church if they were divorced. But if you were divorced, you could not participate in a lot of things. You could not teach Sunday school. You could not be Sunday school superintendent. You could not be a deacon. You could not be an elder. You most definitely could not preach. You could not be a pastor if you were divorced. Nowadays, that's changed. Even in the good old Assemblies of God and in the Church of God, I know people who are divorced and remarried two, three times, and they're still preaching. I got news for you. 30 years ago, that would not have been. But we had a man in our church that I loved to death when I was a kid, and he was divorced, and he was remarried. His wife uh, was his second wife, and she had never been married before, but he had, you know. And the pastor would use him to lead the song service. All people in the church, Martin, just had a fit. And I'm sure, as sure as I'm alive, I'm sure my grandmother was one of them. They just had a fit. Well, you're not supposed to let him lead song service. You're not supposed to let him do stuff like that. Why, well, he's divorced. And uh, this lady told me years later, many years later, I used to love this man and his wife very, very much. They were really terrific people. See, that's a sad thing. You can be gay, still be a terrific person. You can be divorced and still be a terrific person. What's sad is they're so busy looking at your divorce, they're so busy looking at your being gay, that they look past the fact you're a terrific person. Well... Brother and Sister Star were marvelous people. They were very, very nice people. I loved them to death. And uh, Sister Star told me many, many years later, through Facebook as a matter of fact, she told me, she said, you know, Chuck, there was a point in our walk with God when my husband and I were this close to leaving the Pentecostal church. She said, my husband got so much flack because he was divorced. She said, every time the pastor tried to use him to do anything, uh, all the people in the church gave him so much flack. She said that he and I were seriously thinking about just getting up and leaving and going to a more liberal church, to a church where uh, our being, his being divorced would not be quite as big an issue. And honestly, back in those days, that meant you'd have to go like Episcopalian or something, you know. She said, we were literally that close. She said, all of a sudden, one day, Brother Cecil Obar, I used to love Brother Obar, he was about this tall. Maybe this tall. No. <laughs> he was a little fellow. And Brother Obar was a genuinely spiritual, godly man. She said, all of a sudden, one day, said, my husband and I literally were like one Sunday away from walking away from the Pentecostal church for the rest of our lives. And Brother Obar walked over to us and said, The Lord spoke to me to tell you something. And they said, Okay. And Brother Obar said, Stand still. Don't move. Do nothing. Hold your ground. It's going to change. And then Brother Obar looked at them and said, I have no idea why God told me to tell you that. Sister Star said, we did. <laughs> she said, we did. Said, we decided, well, that must be God telling us that we need to stay where we're at. And, you know, we might not like the way things are right now, but things will change. Guess what? They did. Things got a whole lot better for people because divorce became so prevalent. You know, all of a sudden the church began to re-examine the issue of divorce and all this. She said, Chuck, my daughters both grew up and are in Pentecostal ministry. 
One of my daughters is a Pentecostal missionary's wife. The other one is a Pentecostal preacher's wife. She said, if we'd have left, that might never have happened. But see, when you need to hear from God, God will speak to you. When you need to hear from the Lord, He'll find a way to communicate with you. Don't ignore Him when you've heard from Him, because then you're in trouble. And I'm being honest, I'm not kidding. When the Lord goes out of His way to talk to you, Lisa, and let you know something, and you ignore Him, and you decide you're going to go your own way, guess where you wind up? In the belly of the whale. You wind up where Jonah wound up. You wind up in a bad place that's very uncomfortable and very miserable and you're very unhappy and you're struggling and it's all because God tried to talk to you and you ignored Him. You ignored His direction and chose to go your own way. Say, Pastor, I don't understand. You're talking about all these things and you just read to us, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. What in the world is what you're saying have to do with that? very easy. Don't ask and God won't tell. Amen. But if you ask, the word of God says, you will get the answer. You know, a lot of people crack me up. Well, you know, I've asked the Lord about this, and I've asked the Lord about that, but I just don't hear anything. Oh, sure you did, but chances are what you heard isn't what you wanted to hear. Don't tell me God hadn't answered you. Don't tell me God isn't speaking to you. Don't tell me God isn't making His will known to you, because I've got news for you. You're calling God a liar. He said, ask, and it shall be given. Am I telling the truth? Said, if you ask, I'll tell. But don't ask if you don't want to hear the answer. Do you see what I mean when I said this is a prophetic message? It's not about, you know, some big prophecy. I'm trying to tell somebody out there, somebody, whether you're in this room or whether you're online, somebody out there wants to believe that they're asking God questions, but they're not getting an answer. And the Lord says, oh, yes, they are. Their phone is ringing off the hook. I'm answering them all day and all night. The only problem is they don't like the answer that they're hearing. I'm going to tell you, I've, I've gone to pastors and, uh, and men of God that I appreciate and women of God that I appreciate and I love. And I've talked to them about things. When I was engaged, when I decided to ask Stacy years ago to marry me, I did it because, uh, Bill, I don't know, maybe you'll understand. Johnny, I know you'll understand. I did it because, strictly, I felt like I had to do it. I had to marry a woman. That would fix me. That would make everything right. And, and that was going to just cure all my ills, you know. And I, and I thought that's what I needed to do. I finally found a girl dumb enough <laughs> to say yes. Well... I went to Sister Bruce. I went up to Shamrock, Texas to preach for Sister Bruce. Now, Sister and Brother Bruce were almost like a, an adopted mom and dad to me. I love these people. Still do. They won't talk to me. They won't have anything to do with me because, after all, I'm filthy. I'm dirty. I'm vile, you know. Still the same person I was then. I still love the Lord as much as they did then. I still love them as much as I did then. But, you know, they won't have anything to do with me. I went to Sister Bruce and I told her that I'd proposed to this girl. And she said, yes. And you know what Sister Bruce said to me? She said, Chuck, she is not the girl for you. She had never met her. Sister Bruce didn't know this girl from Jack the Ripper. She said, she is not the girl for you. And I said, oh, but, you know, but, 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 but. She is not the girl for you. Now, I'm going to tell you, I know Sister Bruce is a spiritual woman, and I know Sister Bruce hears from the Lord, and I know Sister Bruce wouldn't be saying that to me if she did not know in her spirit that God was trying to tell me something. But I ignored her anyway. I wound up getting married. 
after a month, a month, folks, never consummated our relationship. The girl I married was terrified of intimacy, terrified of it. What did I care? I could have waited 10, 25 years. I didn't bother me no way. So, right? After a month, her mother took her away from me and said, oh, she wasn't ready to get married. We made a mistake. They filed for a divorce, not an annulment, a divorce. I wound up legally divorced, even though I had never consummated my marriage. I opened up a can of whoop worm on myself. <laughs> I mean, and I went into a depression. I became suicidal. I was only 20 years old, you know, at the time. But I went through all this negativity. I went through all this garbage. Why? Because I didn't like the answer God was giving me. While I was in Shamrock, Texas, up in the panhandle there, uh, preaching for Sister Bruce, right? While I'm up there, I'm praying about marrying this girl. And I'm praying about it, and I'm praying about it. And I said, Lord, is this girl for me? And you know what I heard? No. I kid you not. God is my witness. I kid you not. I knew she was not the girl for me. I knew it, Martin. I knew it. God, God didn't have to talk through Sister Bruce because I knew. He'd already told me. When Sister Bruce said what she said, all she was doing was confirming what the Lord had already told me. And I'll never forget telling the Lord, well, then you better make her the girl for me. Oh, boy. Yeah, big me. Big me giving an ultimatum to God. Talk about a mismatched fight. <laughs> Talk about a heavyweight versus a featherweight. Boy, howdy, what arrogance, what stupidity in my head that I was willing to look God in the eye and say, well, you better make her the one because I was so sick and tired of the struggle and the fight that I was living with. You know, I wanted to put that puppy to rest and, and move on with my ministry. <sighs> There was a policy instituted in the U.S. Army, the Armed Forces, by former President Bill Clinton. You know, there had been controversy for many, many years over gay and lesbian people serving openly in the military. Of course, you know, people on the right are never interested in facts. That, that's one thing I love about the religious right. Facts, they're allergic to facts. Oh, they worship Israel. Israel can do no wrong. Everything Israel does is right. Doesn't matter how they treat the Palestinian people. Doesn't matter how they do anything. Everything Israel does is right. Why would it be right now when it was never right in the past? <laughs> Am I telling the truth? In the past, Lisa, did everything Israel do was it right? No. Why would it be right now? But you got all these foolish and stupid people in the evangelical and fundamentalist community. They act like everything Israel does is right. If they bomb Palestinians, if they bomb Lebanon, if they bomb Syria, if they respond with violence, it's right. Just because Israel did it, it's right. Um, that's funny that you feel that way because you want to know what else Israel's done? Israel allowed gay and lesbian people to serve openly in their military from day one. From the very beginning of their nationalization, they allowed gay and lesbian people to openly serve in the military. There has not been a day that the Israeli army ever said, you cannot serve in the military because of your sexual orientation. And guess what? Israel's got one of the finest little armies in the entire world. Their ranks aren't all busted to pieces because they got queers in the army. Isn't it funny, Bill, that they've got gay and lesbian people in their army, but their army is still extremely well-trained, extremely efficient at what they do. Yeah, that's what else Israel's done. They've allowed LGBT people to serve openly in their military from the very beginning. They knew they couldn't afford to be choosy. When you're as tiny a nation as they are, you can't afford to be telling people, you can't be in the army, you can't serve. They've allowed people. Israel is one of the most open societies in the world to LGBT people. I've been told, you go to Tel Aviv, you go to 
uh, parts of Israel, they have some of the biggest pride parades you ever wanted to see. I've been told when you go over there that 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 uh, the the uh, people are very kind and you know very decent to LGBT people. That's what else Israel has done. But we got the religious right. They don't like facts. Now facts and us, we don't get along too well. So they only want to hear what they want to hear. I'm going to tell you something, folks. There are too many people in our communities who give God a passing interest. They, they make, Martin, a half-sincere inquiry of God. Lord, do you really love and accept LGBT people? Can you really be LGBT and, and serve God and be a Christian? And they ask that question. Here's the problem. They really don't want to know the answer. I'm talking to somebody out there. You really don't want to know the answer. You, you, you ask the question, but you really don't want to know the answer. Because as long as you're able to blame your heathenistic lifestyle on, well, I'm going to hell anyway, so it don't matter. Hello now. As long as you can believe that you're condemned just for being who you are, you can just keep looking up at God and saying, well, God, you're just not fair because you condemn me and I have no more control and no more choice over this than I do anything, but you condemn me flat out anyway. And therefore, Johnny, they can keep drugging, they can keep drinking, they can keep whoring, they can keep playing the field, they can keep playing their games because after all, they've allowed themselves to believe that they're condemned and there's no hope. And this preacher out here who has the gall to tell them that, oh yes, you can be a Christian. Oh yes, you can serve the Lord. Oh yes, you can walk in fellowship with God. They don't want to hear that because that makes them responsible now to God. That makes them it their choice whether they're lost or found. That makes it their choice whether they choose heaven or hell. That makes it their choice whether or not they walk in relationship with the Lord. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? They don't want that choice. No, they want to be able to blame God for not having a choice. Do you follow what I'm saying? Somebody's listening to me right now, and that's exactly where you're at in your life. You've been listening to this old preacher preach for the longest time, and you understand every word. You've heard me teach and talk about these subjects, and you understand it, and you know in your heart it's so, but you still want to rebuff it because it doesn't fit in with your choices. It doesn't fit in with the way you want to live your life because... This preacher has the gall to tell you that not only can you be a Christian, not only can you serve God, but if you're going to be a Christian and you're going to serve God, then you better live holy. And you better live godly because God is looking for a testimony and a witness in a lost and dying world. He isn't looking for a bunch of people running around acting like darkness. He's looking for people who are going to act like light. Am I telling the truth? But see, they don't want to hear that, Martin. Well, don't ask! God says, don't ask, I won't tell. Bill Clinton came up with this brilliant idea for the military. He said, here's what we'll do. Instead of just hunting around, and the minute we hear the slightest, uh, uh, you know, um, rumor that somebody is gay or lesbian, we bring them before the court martial boy and we throw them out of the army. Instead of doing that, we're going to adopt a policy. As long as you keep your mouth shut, you don't say anything about it, then everything will be well with the world. We won't ask you. You don't tell us. Everything will be fine. Remember that? Don't ask, don't tell. And boy, for years and years and years, activists in our community were trying to get that thrown out the window because it no more worked than the previous policy did. It was no better than the previous policy was. And it was all based on the notion to start with that somehow or another, Johnny, if you were LGBT, you just were not fit to serve in the armed forces. Which is an entirely idiotic notion to begin with. I just cannot imagine for the life of me a man in the foxhole. 
oh Lord, I can't shoot him, but he is just way too pretty. <laughs> Can you imagine during World War II? Oh Lord, why have I always had this interest in Asian men? I wish they'd have put me in the Atlantic instead of the Pacific, because I, I just love Asian men. Do you, you know how stupid that is? <laughs> you know this preacher likes to be goofy sometimes. Don't ask, won't tell. Don't ask God a question you don't want to hear the answer to. And if you do ask the question, don't stand there and tell me God is not answering you because you're making God a liar. The Lord said, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Did he not? Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. I'm going to tell you the one thing that prevents people from hearing and receiving the answers to questions that will make all the difference in the world to their life is sincerity. How many of us, you see somebody at work or you see them, you know, in church or wherever you see them, and you say, oh, so how you doing? And you really could care less. If they, if they looked at you and said, not so well, I just found out from the doctor I'm going to die tomorrow, you'd pat them on the shoulder and say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Have a good day. <laughs> I really wasn't asking because I wanted to hear. Now, I don't know about y'all. Tommy had a co-worker at one time <laughs> who was one of these personalities. I don't know about you all. I, I've known some people in my life. You ask them, how are they? Oh, dear God, get ready, because you're going to hear a 30-minute sermon on all their woes. Well, I woke up Thursday morning and my toe ached, and I mean, it was a throbbing ache. You know that kind of ache where it just pains you and pains you, and you're trying to stand up, and oh, it just hurt. And, and then, don't you know, after a while, I just felt that pain crawling up into my, into my uh, ankle, and oh, bless God, I had to just sit in bed and watch my stories on television with my leg up on a, a you know, up elevator. And then, of course, my cat come and was licking my toes, and it tickles me when my cat. And you know, they go into this big, long, drawn out story. So, when you see that person, you're trying to figure out a way to say something to them to be friendly, but you don't want to say, How are you? Because you really don't want to hear it. A lot of people approach God with that same level of sincerity. If you sincerely want to know the answer, God sincerely will give you the answer. If you do not sincerely want to know the answer, do me a favor. Don't ask the question. Because God has promised if you ask, he's going to give you the answer. So don't ask the question unless you're ready to hear the answer. And then if you hear an answer that makes you uncomfortable, if you hear an answer that is not quite what you wanted to hear, chances are 99 out of 100 that that's God. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much you can almost bet that's God. Why do I say that? Because, honey, you ain't talking to yourself, telling yourself to do something you don't want to do. I, I've never known anybody. You know, I believe it was uh, Helen Keller who made the comment one time. She's always leery of religious people who claim that God speaks to them and reveals his will to them. She said, uh, somehow or another, God's will and their will always seems to be one and the same. What they want to do and the direction they want to go in and the things they want to do, always, somehow or another, that's what God's telling them to do, whatever it is they want to do. But when it comes to hearing God say anything contrary to what they want, no, they never hear that. God never says, do something they don't want to do. He never says, go somewhere, Bill, that they don't want to go to. No, that, that never happens. Sister Julie Maston a marvelous Pentecostal holiness lady from the Riverside Church of God, a, a, a saint of God that I admire and I love. Sister Julie said years ago to me, she said, Chuck, whatever you do, don't ever tell the Lord what you will not do. 
She said, don't ever tell the Lord, Lord, I will never do thus and so. I will never do that. She said, never tell God what you won't do. She said, because sure as I'm alive, that'll be the first thing he comes at you with. Guess what I want you to do? Yeah. The very thing you told him you couldn't do or you wouldn't do. She said, oh, I'm going to tell you, folks, I'm, I'm serious. How many times have you asked the question of God and what come back to you wasn't necessarily what you wanted to hear? And then you sit around and you try to talk yourself out of the answer. You try to say, well, no, that was probably just me. Oh, that was probably just this. That was probably just that. Because it didn't mesh with what you wanted to hear. Don't ask, won't tell. God's trying to tell you today. Don't you dare ask a question you don't want to hear the answer to. Because if you ask, I'm going to give you the answer. I've been through this twice in my life where I had major, major, major theological questions that I asked God. And it meant I had to take a brand new direction in my walk with God. I had to take a brand new direction in my ministry. I had to take a brand new direction in my church affiliation and denominational affiliation, the whole nine yards. The first time was when I became part of an apostolic church and I was not embracing yet the apostolic message. But the Lord spoke to me and told me, as sure as I'm alive, I moved to a new community in East Texas. I drove past First Pentecostal Church, a United Pentecostal Church. The Lord said, that's where I want you to go to church. I hadn't even been there. Hadn't even visited it. Had never walked in it. The Lord said, that's where I want you to go to church. I said, okay. So I walked in the first Sunday. I said, okay, here I am, a new member. Hadn't even heard the preacher preach. Hadn't heard them sing a song. Didn't hear what kind of music they played. Didn't hear whether or not they had a choir. You see, this is the problem with people, uh, Johnny. We should have this church filled packed today. There shouldn't be one seat available in this place. And if people obeyed God and listened to God, there wouldn't be a seat available in this place today. I'm sure of that. I know it just as sure as I'm alive. Because I asked the Lord one time. I said, Lord, you told me that you were going to speak to people to come be part of this church. That people from all over the country, not locals, but people from other parts of the country, were going to come be part of this church. And I said, Lord, I don't understand. Where are they? And he answered me just as clear as a bell this fast. He said, I have spoken to them. They are not obeying. That's when he told me. I said, well, I'll be a son of a gun. Because I knew he told me he was going to talk to people about coming and being a part of this church. No, we got people today, Martin, they can't hear from God until they go check out the church first. And they make sure they put their seal of approval on the preaching. They make sure they put their seal of approval on the choir. They make sure they put their seal of approval on the programs and on the facilities and on the music and on the worship. Oh, no. Let me tell you something, honey. I might be crazy but I've been walking with God for a long time I've had the Holy Ghost a long time I have gone to communities like I did here in East Texas and God told me what church I was to go to and I had never walked through the door but I walked into that church and I was committed to being a part of that church because why because God told me to go there and I knew if he told me to go there, Martin, it wasn't all about what that church could do for me. It also had to do with what I could bring to that church. Because every one of us, every one of us, every one of you in this room brings something to this church. It's not about money. It's not about money. Every one of us brings our faith. We bring our curiosity. We bring our sincerity. We bring, we bring something to the table. Do you follow what I'm saying? Every one of us. And there are people that God has spoken to to come be part of this church who could have brought something that would have benefited you and I both. See, it wasn't about what they were going to get out of us. It was about what God was trying to bring to us through them. But no, they don't want to obey the voice of God. They don't want to listen to the Lord. Well, here I was attending a church God told me to go to. And I didn't even believe the way these people believe. Now, I, I had been familiar with the controversy, the oneness versus the trinity. I'd been familiar with that my whole life. 
I'd heard about it. I've heard it debated the whole nine yards. Finally, one night, I went home from church one night. I'll never forget it. As long as I live, I will never forget it. And I was frustrated. And I said, okay, Lord. I need to know the answer. Which is right? Are you one or are you three? Let's get this straight. Are you one God or are you three people? And I sat down at my dining room table, Lisa, and I felt the Spirit of the Lord say, put your Bible down and let it open. Not open it, let it open. So I took my Bible like this. Literally, I took it like this. I laid it down on the table and I let it fall open. And I looked down. And the very first passage I looked at said, I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no God. I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no other. And then I took like this, Johnny. I, I just grabbed pages. I didn't look at the page. I just went like, and I began to read. And every single passage I read was talking about God being one. <laughs> every single one. But you know what? I finally asked the question sincerely, Tommy. My whole life I kept kind of asking, but I didn't really want to know the answer. Because God would try to talk to me and I'd ignore it. I'd pass it off. Oh, that's just me. That's just, you know. But that night when I asked the question, Martin, I wanted to know the, I finally got to that place where I really wanted to know the answer. And God gave it to me. And I'm okay. I've been preaching this one God Jesus name message ever since. And I don't plan on giving it up anytime soon. Hallelujah. Because it's conviction. It's in me. God revealed this to me. This isn't somebody. This isn't something a preacher showed me. This isn't something I learned in Sunday school. This is something God revealed to me. Amen. He answered the sincere cry of my heart. And then there was the time, and I'm almost done today, I promise. There was the time when I was in a relationship for a few years with somebody, and the person I was in a relationship with, while we were separated for about a month or so, he began to go to a Jesus name Pentecostal church, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, was baptized in Jesus name. We got back together, and I said, uh-oh. I am in trouble now because I pretty much sworn off the church. I pretty much decided I never, I, my faith hadn't died. My faith was the same it always was. But after being hurt the way I was hurt in the church and after going through everything I went through, I wasn't in the mood to go into any churches, you know. And I said, Lord, I'm in trouble here because Jason has come into this thing. And I can either be a help to him with his walk with God, or I can be a hindrance to him in his walk with God. And I fear God. I do not want to be a hindrance. I said, Lord, you know, you just love to force people's hands. You just love to put us in a corner and make it. You know, said, you, you find a way. You always find a way. To, you're going to just get your way one way or the other, aren't you, Lord? You call me to preach it. By God, you're going to make sure I'm preaching if it kills me. And I begin to ask the question, but Lord, can we be who we are and genuinely be saved. Can we be who we are and be Christians? I need to know the answer. And he and I lived for almost a year completely celibate. I'm not kidding. I'm just being honest. Because I wanted to know the answer to that question before anything. That's how much I fear God, folks. Doesn't mean I'm afraid of God, but that's how much I give God preeminence in my thinking. That's what the word fear means. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, don't reread the story of Sodom and Gomorrah yet. You'll get to that. Don't reread Leviticus yet. Don't reread Romans 1 yet. 
Yeah, you homophobic right-wing lunatics, I know all the clobber passages, so just before you send me some stupid message asking me if I've read them or not, I just quoted them to you, so trust me, I've read them. The Lord said, don't read them, don't, don't look at them yet. He said, here's what I want you to look at first. I want you to look at grace. Because the church has completely fouled up the message of grace. And Martin, I begin a deep research in the Word of God on the issue of grace. And I wrote a study, and my study was, I can't remember how many pages it was. I, I think it might have been close to 30 pages. Yeah. I mean, it could have been a doctoral thesis, you know, on grace. It was all about grace, God. And God walked me through the entire scripture, Lisa, on the issue of grace. And helped me to understand what grace really is. And how grace really works. And how grace is really applied to our lives. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock, and it shall be open. Folks, I'm here to tell you today, there is no excuse for walking in ignorance. There is no excuse for any heterosexual person in the church today to be hateful toward gay people. Because if they ask God sincerely, Lord, am I to hate them or am I to love them? I know for a fact God is going to answer, you better love them. Because if you can't love your brother whom you can see, how can you claim to love God whom you cannot see? Hello now. Don't ask. God says, don't ask, won't tell. As long as you don't ask the question, I won't answer it. But if you do ask it, and if you do ask it sincerely, I will give you the answer. So if you're out there today and you're struggling with issues and you're struggling with reconciling your identity, listen, I'm not standing up here trying to convince you you can be LGBT and Christian. What I'm trying to convince you is you need to talk to the Lord about it because I know the answer he'll give you. Hallelujah. When people come to me and they want to debate me about the oneness of God, you know what I tell them? Talk to the Lord about it. If you're sincere, you really want to know the answer. Talk to the Lord. That's what Brother Davis did with me. The pastor of the church that I went to in East Texas. I kept wanting to debate him, Johnny. I kept trying to goad him into debating the Trinity, you know, because I knew all the arguments. Boy, I knew them. I'd been born and raised in the Assemblies of God. I knew all the answers. And I kept trying to goad Brother Davis. And you know what Brother Davis would do? He'd say, eh, you'll get it. He ticked me off so bad. He made me so mad. He would not debate me. He would not get into an argument with me. He wouldn't even talk about it with me. Say, talk to the Lord about it. I don't want to talk to the Lord about it. I want to talk to you about it. Talk to the Lord about it. When I finally got serious and I finally got sincere and I talked to the Lord, God spoke to me and he showed me Amen. Don't ask, won't tell. Because if you do ask, I will tell. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.